Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. A second wave crisis hitting Ontario long-term care homes amid demands to get those vaccines out faster. We are leaving lives on the table by leaving vaccine in freezers. Where the vaccine rollout is now. More traveling politicians prompt fury from Canadians. You don't get to go and get a tan when we can't bury our family members. It's an absurdity. And concern from experts. And this will cause a public health crisis. And the doctors are in to answer questions about vaccines, variants, and why the new case numbers are still so high. Bonjour tout le monde, c'est Monsieur Steve. Plus, online learning is inspiring creativity from teachers. It's possible. If I can do it, anyone can do it. This is The National. The pace of the pandemic in Canada is accelerating. After hitting 500,000 COVID cases just two weeks ago, today we surpassed 600,000. And of those, nearly 16,000 people have died. In Ontario, there's particular concern about what's going on in long-term care homes. As of today, 207 of them have COVID outbreaks. That's a third of all long-term care homes in the province. With two vaccines now approved for use in Canada, help is on the way. But as Nicole Ireland explains, there's a growing call to get that help to the most vulnerable faster. She gave so much care to everyone. It was her turn. It was her turn to be cared for. COVID-19 took Jennifer Penny's mother, Yvette Brock, early Boxing Day morning. She's one of more than 20 residents who have died in an outbreak at Oakwood Park Lodge in Niagara Falls. Penny wants to know why this is happening to long-term care homes again after all the devastation last spring. They promised to, you know, fix these problems in long-term care. And here we are, you know, the second wave and there, there's just so many places still experiencing this. Many health care providers share her frustration. Honestly, we're approaching a worst case scenario for what could have happened in the long-term care sector in the second wave. Geriatrician Dr. Nathan Stahl has no doubt the next few weeks will be grim because the much feared spike in infections from Christmas or New Year's gatherings has yet to hit. Still, there's hope. Now that Ontario has received more than 140,000 COVID vaccine doses, according to the Ministry of Health, almost 40,000 people, mostly frontline health workers, have been vaccinated. But shots for vulnerable long-term care residents only began a few days ago. Stahl says the province isn't moving fast enough. We've managed to actually get needles in the arms of less than 25% of the supply that we've had. And this is really, really concerning because this could literally save lives. And, you know, we are leaving lives on the table by leaving vaccine in freezers. Tonight, the college representing Ontario's family doctors offered to help with a COVID-19 immunization blitz in long-term care homes. In a statement to CBC News, a spokesperson for Ontario's health minister didn't offer an explanation for the pace of the rollout. Nicole Ireland, CBC News, Toronto. Despite strong restrictions for weeks in parts of Ontario, case rates in the province remain stubbornly high. Today, Ontario logged 2,964 new infections. Yesterday, it was more than 3,300. And if we look at the seven-day moving average, the trend is troubling. The case rate is up 22% just since Christmas. And in Quebec, also a province with weeks of strong restrictions, today's tally was 2,869, just behind Ontario's. And the trend in the daily average is similar as well. The case rate in Quebec up 14% since Christmas. We know how important public health guidelines are, but some politicians have been ignoring them. As of tonight, the number of elected officials revealed to have traveled outside the country on vacation is still growing. As Magda Gabersalasa shows us, there are consequences. Separated from her parents during this pandemic, Kat Lantang has had to make some tough decisions. When her mom's health took a turn, she decided not to travel to Nicaragua. It was a terrible decision, but I have a five-year-old son and we are not vaccinated. I didn't want to put my dad at risk and um, those were really difficult decisions to make. Her mother didn't recover and while Lan Tang grieves her loss from afar, the list of politicians who defied government recommendations and traveled over the holidays continues to grow. This weekend, at least two Alberta Conservative MLAs are facing criticism for trips away. 
Jason Steffen was in Arizona. Pat Rain is flying back from Mexico. This while the message to Canadians all along has been to avoid non-essential travel. The reality is that you don't get to go and get a tan when we can't bury our family members. It's an absurdity. And today news that two Liberal MPs travelled in December to the U.S. MP Samir Zabiri said he went to see an ailing family member. And MP Kamal Kara went to a memorial for an uncle who'd passed. Both have stepped down from various roles. Now, what this academic done? says if politicians don't face like consequences, public health will. If they're able to flout the rules, if politicians think that the rules don't apply to them, then no one else is going to act in a way that will support the rules. And this will cause a public health crisis. And though many of the politicians have apologized for Lan Tang, it just won't do. If they can flagrantly mock um, our pain and totally disregard, you know, trying to keep each other safe and value human life, then they don't deserve to be in public office. Lan Tang is staying put, waiting for the day that she can travel safely to scatter her mother's ashes. Magda Gebrasalasa, CBC News, Toronto. And we know of other Liberal MPs who made trips outside the country, though not during the holidays. The statement from the Liberal Party whip named three. Alexandra Mendez went to Portugal in July, Lynn Bissett to Mexico, stopping briefly in Massachusetts in August. And in September, MP Patricia Latanzio went to Ireland. The statements noted all the trips were to deal with essential family affairs. While some politicians may be sending mixed messages, a federal program may be compensating Canadians who ignore travel guidelines. Valeria Corey Minocchio explains. For these Montrealers, following public health guidelines means staying in the cold and making the most of it. Just to see people coming back and I with a tan, <laughs> that's, that's kind of frustrating, yeah. I traveled a lot before the pandemic, so I understand that it's, uh, it's something that people want to do in winter. But those who do travel could actually get up to $1,000 when they return to quarantine through a federal program. The Canada Recovery Sickness Benefit is meant to cover workers who don't have paid sick leave and may need support while they self-isolate due to the virus. Those who meet the program requirements are eligible to receive $500 per week for a maximum of two weeks. That, in theory, includes travelers. I think it's sending exactly the wrong message. It's a little bit like, you know, do something bad and you're going to get the gift. The federal employment minister is already trying to make changes, saying the program was never intended to incentivize or encourage Canadians to not follow public health or international travel guidelines, and we are actively looking at all the available options to address the issue. Opposition politicians are calling on Ottawa to move fast. It's completely unacceptable given the, the surging second wave, the, the new um, COVID uh, variant. We don't know how many uh, non-essential travelers might try to, ex uh, to exploit the loophole, but it needs to be closed and it needs to be closed firmly now. Other MPs say it's not fair for those who followed public health recommendations. There's a lot of people who uh, cancelled their flight, cancelled the, the trip that they, uh, they had planned and did not even get their money back from uh, the airlines. Already, the rules for air travellers are tightening up. Starting Thursday, Canadians returning home will have to test negative for COVID-19 before they can enter the country. Valeria Corey Minocchio, CBC News, Montreal. Let's bring in infectious disease specialist, Dr. Lenora Saxinger. And Dr. Saxinger, you tweeted on Saturday about all the restrictions so many people are living under, including yourself, and your frustration with the reaction to this news of people traveling abroad. Tell us more about that. Well, I guess I do find it quite disappointing because, you know, we were seeing our highest case numbers in Alberta ever at the early part of December. And we're just seeing cresting numbers in hospital right now. And a lot of healthcare workers are under a lot of stress because of that. And so I found it disappointing that um, people wouldn't kind of obey the spirit of their restrictions a little bit more closely, especially people who are in a position of leadership. So, of course, what these politicians did was technically legal, but strictly from an infectious disease physician standpoint, what would your recommendation be on international travel? 
I really think people should be curtailing all unnecessary travel, and I think that it's it's really important to actually think about what necessary means when we have systems under so much stress. Um, if you carry infection to the place you're going, you're putting their system under more stress and endangering others. If you bring in infection back, um, you are actually adding to you know your own risk, the risk of your family, and the burdens where you're coming home to. So I, I really think people should be looking to stay put while the vaccine is rolled out. Um, and look forward to traveling more when it's safer. All right, Dr. Saxinger, we'll be talking to you again later in the hour. Thanks. Thanks. The holidays are over, but many Canadian school kids won't be returning to class tomorrow. Ontario, Quebec and Alberta will stick to online learning for another week, possibly longer in some cases. Here in B.C., though, classrooms are set to reopen. Prior Stewart shows us how thousands of parents are pushing to stop that. Rosemary Cooper's two sons are going back to class tomorrow, but after the holidays, she's a bit anxious. In the back of my mind, I have a little bit of a concern that some people will have got together and Christmas and New Year's and maybe not followed the rules. The worry over a potential bump in transmission is why many provinces have pushed back the return to school. Now in B.C., more than 40,000 have signed a petition urging the province to do the same. We're counting ex actual exposure letters. Kathy Marlis signed on. She spearheaded an effort to keep track of COVID cases in schools. We all want our kids to enjoy their friends and be at school, but there's this sort of darkness that's, settle that's settling on our shoulders. Like, if we send our kids, are they going to be safe? And many teachers are concerned too. We do feel like there should be more safety measures in place, especially given the fact that the virus has been mutating in different places around the world. Currently, masks aren't mandatory in BC classrooms, but the province says a task force has been working to ensure a safe return for students. People are preparing to make sure that we can go back to school safely um, next week, and that is uh, kind of exciting for lots of children I know. The province has said there's a low rate of COVID transmission in schools. 70% haven't had any COVID exposures, while just 12% of all confirmed cases have been reported among school-aged children. But some say the data isn't very clear and doesn't highlight that some schools have had multiple COVID exposures. This data analyst says specific information about where the virus is spreading would help. We don't really know this. Like We don't have, say, at the school district level, um, up-to-date information about the level of community spread that could help inform those decisions. Which parents are having to make about whether to send their children back to class. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Today, B.C. became the second province to approve the NHL's COVID-19 safety plans for a season set to start in just 10 days. Greg Ross asked an epidemiologist for his thoughts on the league's precautions as work on that new season is rolling ahead. Until they, they tell us differently, we're, we're very confident that, uh, that we'll begin at Scotiabank Arena on January 13th. The Maple Leafs general manager says the team is getting ready to play home games in Toronto, even though the Ontario government hasn't yet given them approval. My understanding from the NHL correspondence is that everything looks, looks to be in, in good order. So far, only Alberta and B.C. have granted the NHL permission to play. Manitoba, Ontario and Quebec are still considering it, and there's a lot to mull over, given that teams will be traveling from province to province. Any travel includes risk. Uh, population mixing, bringing the, the pathogen from one place to another, that's how it moved around the planet is traveling with people, so no question there's a risk there. The NHL says it will take plenty of precautions, including regular testing, but even that raises questions. Are they using resources, testing resources that are better spent elsewhere? And that's not entirely clear. I think Canadians will just drink it up every night. Hockey analyst Nick Kiprio says even without fans in the stands, these games are sure to be memorable in the league's first ever all-Canadian division. It's going to be phenomenal. It may be so good, Greg, that they may not want to go back to the other way. That's how great I think this, this season's going to be. As it stands right now, there are two all-Canadian matchups scheduled for opening night. Edmonton will host Vancouver and Toronto will host Montreal. That game is still awaiting official approval. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. In U.S. COVID news, veteran interviewer Larry King has reportedly been hospitalized for more than a week with the disease. To you, my audience, 
thank you. And instead of goodbye, how about so long? That is King's farewell from CNN, where he interviewed celebrities and politicians for 25 years. King's family is optimistic that he'll pull through, but the number of Americans who have not has now hit 351,000. In California, it has gotten so bad that some funeral homes have had to turn away families. They just don't have room for any more. Tonight, astonishing evidence of what Donald Trump will do to stay in power. A demand caught on tape that Georgia's Secretary of State overturn election results. As Derek Stoffel tells us, this comes at a critical moment. The House will come to order. The first day of the new session of the U.S. Congress was overshadowed by Donald Trump's latest effort to stay in power. You should want to have an accurate election, and you're a Republican. We believe that we do have an accurate election. This is part of an hour-long call between Trump and Brad Raffensperger, the Georgia state official in charge of election results, obtained by the Washington Post. All I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. It's a stunning ask, the president calling for an official to change election results. Fraudulent election. One that is bound to raise legal questions. Campaigning in Georgia, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris called Trump's conversation an abuse of power. Well, it was, yes, certainly the voice of desperation. <laughs> Most certainly that. It's not the only worry, though, for the next president. 15 Republican senators want this week's vote in Congress to certify Biden's victory paused, allowing for a 10-day audit of the results. We are not acting to thwart the democratic process. We're acting to protect it. The fact of the matter is that we have an unsustainable state of affairs in this country where we have tens of millions of people that do not view this election result as legitimate. Their effort may have captured the headlines, but it will change nothing. Everyone should understand they will not be successful at overturning the results of the election. Uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be sworn in on January 20th. For now, though, all eyes are on the state of Georgia and the two Senate elections there on Tuesday, elections that will help determine which party controls the U.S. Congress and how much political leeway Joe Biden will have to get things done. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Washington. With tensions rising between the U.S. and Iran in the final weeks of the Trump era, thousands took to the streets to mark the anniversary of the deadly American drone strike, which killed Iranian General Qasem Soleimani. Many demanding revenge and the U.S. troops be expelled from Iraq. Soleimani and a top Iraqi militia leader were killed in the attack at Baghdad's airport. Soon, the Canadian government will introduce new legislation aimed at policing illegal online content. The issue hit the spotlight last month after allegations the website Pornhub let users post illegal videos, including child pornography. That site has since brought in new rules allowing only properly identified users to upload content. Karen Pauls now with what the government is hoping to force companies to do. I, you know did whatever he asked. But what I didn't know was that he had uh, downloaded recording software. This Canadian woman, whose identity we're protecting, was only 14 when she was victimized online. And I started getting links of me on, like, Pornhub and all these websites that I didn't even know existed, constantly, like, having to relive my trauma. Stalked and harassed online and in real life, she spent years trying to get social media platforms and adult websites to remove the explicit video of her. I would say none of them were helpful. But help is coming from the federal government. New draft regulations would require social media platforms and adult sites operating in Canada to remove illegal content within 24 hours or face significant penalties. This should include exploitation of children. If these companies refuse to comply with our laws and regulations, then yes, we would, we would, we would have a regulator who could impose fines but this NDP critic says the penalty should go beyond fines. If a 15-year-old sends pictures of his 15-year-old girlfriend, he can be charged with child porn. 
but the people who run Pornhub uh, can't. And why is that? Meanwhile, Ottawa is working with the Canadian Centre for Child Protection on some of the logistics. It has a powerful web crawler that searches the internet for illegal images. We have detected um, 27 million suspect images. Signe Arneson says these draft regulations are long overdue. We've trusted that companies will manage their platforms properly. We know that is not happening in our space. These things are like a cancer. They just grow and grow and grow. Like whoever is, you know, managing them right now isn't doing a good job. Survivors hope the legislation will pass quickly and that it will actually have some teeth. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. The pandemic has forced teachers at all levels to adapt. I grabbed my iPhone and I, I had no idea what I was doing and I just started filming. Up next, creative fixes to keep students inspired and learning. Plus, setting our expectations for 2021. From the vaccines to the new variant, we ask our panel of doctors what the next few weeks will look like. And later, a pandemic project that takes the cake. Well, like, we've cleaned the store, like we might as well just make a couple fun videos. How a Canadian teen went from Dairy Queen to TikTok royalty. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The pandemic has upended schools across Canada from kindergarten through post-secondary. Students and educators have had to adjust. But amid the closures and remote learning, Deanna Sumanag Johnson brings us some stories of innovation. When schools suddenly went online in the spring, third grade French immersion teacher Steve Massa knew he had to keep his students engaged somehow. I grabbed my iPhone and I, I had no idea what I was doing and I just started filming uh, and I filmed my first video. As the months went by, Massa's energetic YouTube videos grew in complexity and in popularity. Bonjour tout le monde, c'est Monsieur Steve. In his videos, he takes his students on field trips, talks about holidays, all in French. Videos he kept making even after he returned to class. And I know there's a lot of teachers out there who, you know, aren't as comfortable with technology, and that's cool, and that's totally fine. But it's possible. If I could do it, anyone can do it. Post-secondary educators faced their own challenges when classes went online. Chief among them, teaching practical, hands-on knowledge that normally requires labs or students working directly with people. At Bow Valley College, a new virtual reality lab is helping nurses in training get a sense of what it's like to be one-on-one -on -one with a patient. There's nothing like seeing your patient bent over their bedside table trying to take a breath and struggling for breath. And with the toggles, they can actually feel and then they see and they hear what that patient is experiencing. At Dalhousie University in Halifax, this professor created a course loosely based on the board game Pandemic. Students worked in real time, racing against the clock. We had four teams. There were researchers, there were scientists, there were medics, and there were quarantine experts. When one of their moves were executed, the clock was ticking, and they'd have 72 to 48 hours to execute their next move uh, before the next team could go. In case you're wondering, the students doing the simulation took on the pandemic and won, just as these educators did by keeping learning exciting during tough times. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, what you need to know about rising COVID-19 case numbers and the vaccine rollout. Our panel of doctors share their concerns and hope for the weeks ahead. Welcome back. For many people, this year brings a lot of hope in the fight against the pandemic. With two vaccines, Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna, approved by Health Canada, public health officials are hoping to vaccinate every Canadian who chooses by the end of September. So far, more than 100,000 people, mostly healthcare workers and long-term care residents, have been given at least one dose of either vaccine. But there's concern over what some are calling a slow rollout that included some vaccine clinics closing for the holidays, as Ontario and Quebec both saw record case numbers in recent days. Pressure on ICUs is mounting, and there's worry over just how widespread that UK variant might be. So what will 2021 look like with vaccines, variants and restrictions? 
I'm joined now by infectious disease specialist Dr. Zane Chagla in Mississauga, Ontario, and Dr. Lenora Saxinger in Edmonton. And Dr. Chagla, I want to start with you because I'm trying to figure out what's happening, particularly in southern Ontario, where there has been some degree of lockdown now for at least a couple of weeks, and yet case numbers are still so high. What's going on? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the Toronto area has been in a semi-state of lockdown for almost a month and a half now, and, and the rest of Ontario did go into a full lockdown as of the 26th. There is some growth in those regions outside of Toronto, which may eventually succumb to the lockdown and growth come down in the next few days. But it does bring up the greater discussion of the people that do need to go to work, even in this lockdown state, are still being infected in the greater Toronto area. Uh, and, and again, personal gatherings are still being implicated in the greater Toronto area, which is unfortunately something a lockdown is not able to prevent. And so what do you think the lessons are here for what needs to be done? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, number one is supporting those people that have to work despite the restrictions in place, making sure they have access to testing, making sure they have access to financial supports to, to support isolation uh, and not to work while having symptoms. And, you know, I think still there's there's work to public messaging to making sure people stay at home, limit their gatherings. As much as we've hammered this home, uh, I think it still needs to be implicated going forward, knowing that there's still ongoing transmission. And this is still a big point. Dr. Saxinger, I was speaking with you early in December. And at that point, case numbers in your province were soaring. And there was a lot of worry about what might be happening in hospitals around Christmas time. What ended up happening? Well, we actually saw continued increases in hospitalization and ICU numbers, um, really from our case peak in the first half of December. And we're just probably seeing the peak now. It might be starting to plateau. So we have, you know, between 900 and 1,000 people in hospital, around 150 in ICU. For our population, that's a lot. That's like two or three extra hospitals and maybe 10 extra ICUs of COVID patients in our system right now. And so the system is, is coping well. I actually think our acute care services are doing an admirable job, but it's definitely stretched. It's definitely very difficult. And what's the mood like? What's it like inside the hospitals in Alberta? Um, I, I think if we hadn't had news that vaccine rollout was starting, I think the mood would be a lot darker, but because that kind of gives us a way to see the way out, People are coping reasonably well, but there certainly are some people who are getting a lot of extra work right now. And it's a, it's a stress. It's definitely a stress on the system. Dr. Saxinger, it was exactly two weeks ago we learned about this UK variant, which appears to be much more contagious. What's the latest that, that we know about it now? Well, for the UK variant right now, a lot of labs are tooling up to try to be able to do higher numbers of uh, samples for screening for that. Um, and we're just trying to get a handle on whether or not we think this is contributing to the current surges um, across the country. And so far, it, it doesn't look like it's clear, honestly. But it is a, an alarming variant because it could actually stand to make it much harder to control the virus during the vaccine rollout phase. And by that, I mean we have to do better at the basics um, to be able to keep this from taking off on us again. Dr. Chagla, you and your colleagues have been very good about uh, pointing out that viruses do mutate, so that shouldn't come as a surprise. But how concerned do you think we should be about this UK variant? Yeah, I mean, it's it's shown the ability to transmit, and I think we are seeing that obviously in the UK. There's some emerging evidence out of Denmark where it's shown up and is rapidly starting to replace. Um, and so, as, as Dr. Saxinger had mentioned, uh, the buffer that we have with some of our public health interventions gets much smaller when this variant starts circulating. Um, our ability to, you know, function as a society, keep schools open, keep essential workplaces open, particularly during this massive vaccine rollout, uh, really does balance against this variant transmitting. So it's going to be very important that these measures stay in place, that people still minimize their gatherings and, and really report when it's sick. Uh, and uh, and it's going to be especially important for the vaccine campaign to roll out to decrease the burden in our communities altogether of this variant and whatever other variants are out there. And Dr. Chagla, speaking of the vaccine, health officials in the UK have, have changed the dosing requirements for two vaccines, allowing the second one to be administered up to three months after the first. And I guess the, the attempt here is to achieve broader immunity. What's your view of that strategy? 
Yeah, I mean, there, there's evidence from other vaccinations where you can delay the booster a few weeks, even a few months. And so, you know, I think they're, they're rolling this into the concept. There is some scientific data around this in other cases. There's nothing in the vaccine monographs that allows this. But, I, you know, I think you're, you're taking the effect of, again, getting that buffer for logistical reasons to get more vaccine out. So it's, a, it's a, an interesting approach. I think they'll generate data. I really do hope that they study people kind of right before they get that second dose to make sure their antibody responses are still optimal. Um, but, you know, certainly all of us will be able to learn from this moving forward at the optimal strategy. And, you know, there, there is some scientific validity to this, uh, making sure that people get the second dose, but stretching out that second dose a little bit more. And Dr. Saxinger, the first Monday of 2021 is coming up for a lot of people. That really is the kickoff to the new year. What are you looking for in the, in the coming weeks? Well, I, I think that we've been, um, we've learned so much about this virus and we are in a much better position than I could have imagined having a vaccine that we can start to roll out. We have a couple of curveballs with the current surges and with hospital capacity. But um, I think I see the way forward as being applying what we've learned very, very well and getting the vaccine out as quickly as we can. And I do think that we will have a much better looking summer. Dr. Chagley, you spent two hours with us on the radio this afternoon, something Dr. Saxinger has done as well. As you know, I appreciate the time from both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. Still ahead, we'll revisit my conversation with the NHL's first black player. You can't change the color of your skin. If people can't accept you for the individual that you are, then that's their problem. The amazing Willie O'Ree on his impact on the game and the continued fight for more diversity. Team Canada meets Russia tomorrow in the semifinals of the World Juniors after an impressive win over the Czech Republic. And McMichael beats his man long. And the front is out the empty net. Connor McMichael scoring on the Czech's empty net. The 3-0 shutout has thrown a spotlight on Canada's goaltender, Devin Levi, a name we're likely to hear a lot more of. As the World Juniors wind down and the NHL gets set to return, we'd like to revisit an interview with Willie O'Ree, the first black NHL player. I spoke to him back in November as he reflected on his legacy and the fight against anti-black racism in hockey. At a time when the National Hockey League had only six teams and every player was white, Willie O'Ree made history. January 18, 1958, the first black player in the NHL. Like the legendary Brooklyn Dodger Jackie Robinson did before him, Willie O'Ree had broken the color barrier at the highest level of his sport. But his achievement didn't get much attention at the time, in part because he played just 45 games in the NHL. Even that was remarkable when you consider he was blind in one eye after getting hit with a slap shot as a junior. But O'Ree did have a long career in the professional minor leagues, and his impact on the game is still being felt today. How you doing? Surprisingly, it wasn't until the late 90s the league invited O'Ree to work with them to promote diversity. And that's where I first met him, in Vancouver. This weekend, the NHL announced it's created a brand new job for Willie O'Ree to try to encourage kids from diverse ethnic backgrounds to get involved in hockey in Canada and the United States. What a difference 40 years makes. From playing hockey on the frozen ponds in the Maritimes to Hockey Night where in Canada. You where are you from? Uh, where are you from? Well, I'm from Fredericton, New Brunswick, mm -hmm. and I played most of my hockey there. To his induction to the Hockey Hall of Fame, you can follow O'Ree's trailblazing path in his new memoir, Willie, the game-changing story of the NHL's first black player. I spoke with Willie O'Ree from his home in Berkeley, California, and asked about that historic debut in the NHL. Willie O'Ree, it's a real pleasure to, to get to talk to you. Hello. Thank you, Ian. It certainly is a pleasure. Your groundbreaking path is obviously often compared to Jackie Robinson in baseball. What was it like for you on that day in terms of, of the, the issue of race? Well, um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't have any problems with uh, any racial remarks or racial slurs directed towards me. It was later on when I went to uh, uh, cities like um, Detroit and uh, Chicago. Uh, and New York, um, I was uh, received with racial remarks and racial slurs, not only from the players, but fans in the stand. I mean, I'd sit in the penalty box, uh, you know, fans would come by and, you know, spit at me or throw a drink at me and call me, the, the uh, you know, the N-word or some racial remark. And 
you know, I, I just sit there and, and, and take it. And back then, uh, referees and uh, linesmen, and, you know, they didn't, they didn't do anything. And even ushers and, and uh, people that were um, working in the arena uh, never made any uh, remark. So speaking of Hockey Night in Canada, you were interviewed on the television version by Ward Cornell, and, and we're going to play a, a clip of that now. In terms of this business of being the Jackie Robinson of hockey, have you had any troubles? No, none, none that you could uh, say that were troubles. I've heard a few jeers like that, but uh, I guess all hockey players get yeah. that. So, Willie, you made a decision. I know you, you described this in, in your memoir to kind of stay away from you know, talking in detail about racism in that interview. Why? You know, I, um, I fought a lot. I fought because I had to, not because I wanted to, but, you know, guys wanted to see what I was made of. And I had stick bites and I fought with this, but... It, it always came back to the same thing where the racial remarks and racial slurs were directed towards me. And I kind of let it went in one ear and out the other. That's one thing my brother told me. He said, Willie, names will never hurt you unless you let them. And if, if people can't accept you for the individual that you are, then that's their problem, not, uh, not yours. And uh, um, it, it, it went along, and I, uh, I, I felt that I had, um, I had, I had played uh, the 21 years I played pro that... Uh, uh, I played to the best of my ability and tried to represent the, the hockey club to the best of my ability. You know, I met you back in 1998 at an event in Vancouver, and I thought then what I think now, uh, seeing you speak and listening, reading your memoir, there is a quiet dignity about you, but at the same time, you're no pushover. Like, you're a tough guy. And, and you made a decision in your memoir to mention a couple of people by name who, who really bothered you. And one is Eric Nestorenko, Chicago Blackhawk player. And, and you tell the story about how when you played his team, he called you the N-word. But you made a decision to, to tell that story and use his name in the memoir. Why did you do that? That was probably the only player that I really had problems with was Nestor Ankle. He deliberately, you know, butt-ended me in the mouth and, and knocked my teeth out and broke my nose. And, and uh, uh, I, just wanted, uh, I just wanted to let people know that, hey, this is the guy that, uh, that really gave me the most problems uh, um, during the time that I played uh, with the Bruins. And the fascinating thing is, and, and I think a lot of people can relate to this, even if race is not the issue, if they, you know, have an encounter with somebody years later, you ran into each other at a hockey event and you wondered how he would respond to you and, and he was just casual and just said hi like nothing had happened. Yeah, well, I had put, uh, he was number 15 and I, uh, I had number 15 in the, in, the back of my, uh, in the back of my mind. And I left the league in 1961. Uh, and then in 1991, 30 years later, I got a nice letter um, from, the, from the NHL uh, inviting me to the all to the all-star game in um, in, in uh, Chicago and I says well why are you inviting me it's been 30 years since I left the league uh, why didn't you invite me 10 years after I left or <laughs> five years and they said well we realized that you broke the color barrier and we'd like you to come to to uh, Chicago so there was an all-star um, luncheon dinner I was sitting uh, with the nine other people at this table and my wife wanted a, a glass of wine, and there wasn't any white wine on the table. And uh, I said, "Well, I'll go to out to the bar." And then Nestor Rico comes and stands to my to my left, and um, I didn't say anything. And he looked down at me because he was about six four, and I'm, I'm five nine. And he looked down and he says, "Hello, Willie. Uh, what's going on?" And I I looked up at him. I said. Nothing, Eric. And I just said, well, in my back of my mind, I said, let's go. Let's get it on right here. And uh, he just um, got his drink and went to the left. And I, I got my drink and I went back to the table. And I never saw him again that evening. So you thought there might be a fight? Or did you feel like maybe there should have been a fight? Um, after 30 years, he probably still remembered me. But I was ready to go with him right there, right there at the bar. But he just uh, turned and uh, went you know, went his way and I went mine. Yeah, well, whether he remembered you or not, you certainly remembered him and you remembered the way he treated you and you remembered the N-word. And, and, and again, I'm going to read from your book. Maybe he thought using the N-word against me was just old-fashioned trash talking. It's not. Trash aims to needle an opponent by casting doubt on his strength. Racism aims to diminish the humanity of a person, period. It's not about the game. It's about your life. And yet, will he... Kids are still getting called the N-word in hockey today. I know. 
it's not it's not going to stop overnight. Yeah, you know, and I've uh, I've got letters and I've got phone calls from from fathers and mothers, um, you know, asking me what 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 uh, what can these their sons and daughters do coming off the ice crying, you know, 10, 11, 12 year old kids. But um, uh, we're, we're working in the right direction. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it, it may take 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 years, maybe not in my lifetime, but um, it's, it's just too bad uh, the way things are going on with, uh, with, with the racism and, and the race problem. But, you know, now in the National Hockey League, you know, uh, players, uh, players are being fined in, in suspensions for, you know, using, um, you know, um, racial slurs and racial remarks directed towards the players. You know, racism is the kind of thing that can end if people just choose to end it. And so for the people who are watching here who may be hockey parents or hockey players or referees in minor hockey, what's your message to them, Willie? I just say, you know, you know, feel good about yourself and, and like yourself. You know, you, you can't change the color of your skin. And I know you wouldn't want to. And as I said about myself, if people can't accept you for the individual that you are, then that's their problem. Just go out and, and uh, be, you know, be who you are and treat people uh, the way that you'd like to be treated. And we haven't even talked about the fact that you played in the NHL with just one eye, which is, you know, your teammates, when they discovered that, found that unbelievable. But you are an incredible athlete. You are, as I say, a man of, of great dignity and obviously of great courage. And uh, I really enjoyed reading your memoir. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Ian. It, it was a pleasure, really. And as we go to break, some sad news to tell you about from the world of music and sport. British singer Jerry Marsden has died. Marsden, the lead singer of Jerry and the Pacemakers, was best known for that rendition of You'll Never Walk Alone, the song adopted by fans of Liverpool FC. It is now considered one of the great anthems in the world of soccer. Jerry Marsden was 78 years old. When we come back, serving up viral videos, one Ontario teen's pandemic success story is next in our moment. An Ontario teen has become a TikTok sensation over the last year, serving up behind the scenes looks at Dairy Queen cakes and shakes. Morgan Book has racked up nearly 50 million likes and over 1.6 million followers. The grade 12 student says it's been a way to connect with people and her community during this pandemic. And that is our moment. I started them last January and it was a cold winter day like no customers are in the store and my co-worker and I were like well like we've cleaned the store like we might as well just make a couple fun videos we made um like a treats of pizza and a cake video and the cake video got six million views in a couple days and then we gained 40,000 followers over those couple days so that was like when it, it really it peaked in the day I think it's just there was no other Dairy Queen TikTok accounts as far as I knew. I think mine was one of the first ones to do it. So no one's ever seen that before. No one knew we did cakes. Everyone thought we got them shipped in and everything. So I think seeing that was really cool. In the beginning, we would just like film just random orders, like giving out no personal information or anything like that, just like the decorating of the cake. Um, but then as the account grew and everything, more people were like, can you film yourself making my cake? And so that's like, that's the, the account runs itself now. People just ask every single day. So it just makes it a little bit easier. When COVID hit last March, there was really no school. Um, although I was working a lot, I had really nothing to like work like really hard at. So now that I have the TikTok account, like it's just an added thing. It's not added stress at all. I love doing it. It's just something to work towards more. And I've met a lot more people and everything. So yeah. In how many ways is that fantastic? First of all, her parents own that DQ franchise and they say sales are up 15 to 18% just on the basis they feel of the video, so that's cool. Secondly, a viral video on TikTok doesn't make fun of anybody. It's, it's just fun, family-friendly video, so that's cool. Third, I'm famished, but that really should be no surprise to anybody. Uh, and fourth, think of all the companies tonight that are saying, we need to copy that somehow. That is The National for January 3rd. Good night.